we have plenty of time to get through what we need to get through. Let me pull up our chapter 24 PowerPoint so we can get started <clears throat> in the introduction of the digestive system, right? So I'd like to start off talking about the digestive system, going over some of the basic organs in the structure of the system. All of this is self-explanatory. I'm sure you guys are familiar with these things already. So <clears throat> ultimately, the digestive system has what we call primary organs of digestion that form a hollow tube that can be referred to as the GI tract, although they, technically the gastrointestinal tract pretty much starts at your stomach. I refer to the whole thing as a GI tract, or we, we have another term for it is called the alimentary canal. So starting at your mouth, we have our oral cavity. Of course, not your teeth and your tongue, they're separate from the tube. But the hollow tube includes your oral cavity, your esophagus, leading down to your stomach. The food swallowed through the esophagus goes to the stomach. From your stomach, it goes into the first part of the small intestine. And the artist here kind of, you know, made a dotted line to show you that it's posterior to these tissues. But the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. We have three parts to the small intestine, the duodenum, then what we call the jejunum, and then the ileum. So all your food is moving through the small intestine and then will be emptied into the large intestine at the right lower side of your abdominal cavity into the colon, the large intestine. And so the food then will move up the right side of your body <clears throat> in what's called the ascending colon, and then across your abdomen in the transverse colon, down the left side of your body in the descending colon, and then where the colon makes a little S-shaped curve, it's called the sigmoid colon, which leads into the rectum, then what's called the anal canal, and then the anus as we go to the bathroom and get rid of our solid waste, which we call feces. So that's all the tube. So obviously all the structures on that tube, your esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, all of that, are primary organs. But we have structures and organs that lie on the outside of the tube, which are obviously vitally important for the normal functions of the digestive system to work correctly. And that includes your teeth and your tongue and your oral cavity. Obviously, we chew up our food. We manipulate the food with our tongue. The salivary glands, which lie on the outside of the oral cavity, secrete saliva to the inside of the oral cavity. Those are on the outside of the tube. <clears throat> so any structure or gland, which is on the outside of the tube, are referred to as accessory structures or organs of digestion, right? So those are on the outside. In fact, everything in red that you see is on the outside. The liver, we'll get to that on Thursday, is not directly part of the tube, but is important. Same thing with the gallbladder, the little green thing you see, that's on the outside of the tube. And then we have the pancreas kind of Again, the artist dotted, did a dotted line, lies behind our stomach, <clears throat> and it's not part of the tube either. So all of those glands and structures are called accessory structures or organs or glands of the digestive system. And so I just made a couple of slides. The text information I just went through is on here. GI tract, that long tube, open-ended. Your food moves through there. We process it in many ways that we're gonna be learning and include various parts like your esophagus, stomach, intestine, all of that. The accessory structures are kind of listed out here. The text part that really is all in red <coughs> that you see right here. All right, so just know that those are accessory structures. We're gonna be going through each one of them, what they do, um, their functions, what they're secreting, and all of that. 
Now, the process of digestion, the actions of the digestive system. Obviously, you know, we're going to be breaking our food down. I mean, that's, that's what digestion means, right? Breaking food items down. There's actually two different ways that we're going to be breaking our food items down as well. But your digestive system as a whole performs six different processes, functions, in order to complete the digestive process. To include all six of these means that we have completely brought food into the system, in some way moved it and extracted the nutrients from the food, and generated solid waste material that we then expel out of the body. Six different processes are involved in that. So the process of eating food, taking food into the system is just called ingestion. Once we ingest the food, we have to move the food items down the length of the GI tract. We also mix the food with glandular secretions in certain parts of the tract. So we're going to learn what those glands are, what some of the cells are that produce certain molecules and products and enzymes. And when those glands and the gland cells are secreting their products into the tube, that's just called secretion. So down the length of the tube in various places, we have different secretions where the food is then going to be mixed and moved through the tube in a process called motility. So at certain times we increase motility, at certain times we decrease motility in different parts of the tube. Same thing with secretion mechanisms. At certain times we're secreting more at one spot and then less at that spot, but more at another spot. So see this graphic is just generic. It's just showing obviously just a straight tube. So we have these processes going on down the length of the tube at different times and different amounts, depending on what phase of digestion we're in. But all in all, we're performing these down the length of the tube. So motility, we're mixing and moving our food and really churning it up and moving it down the tube. We then have all of those enzymes that were secreted from the different types of glands, in the different parts of the tube are going to chemically break down our food molecules into smaller food molecules. Because those enzymes perform catabolic reactions, which is basically a fancy way of saying hydrolysis. They're gonna break chemical bonds in large complex molecules. And so that we can release smaller molecules that are more manageable to be absorbed through certain parts, linings of the, of the tube into our blood, which is called absorption. So here we're just absorbing all the nutrients we need as we have chemically processed them into manageable small molecules that have the ability to be transported across the membranes of the cells that line the tube. For instance, you absorb some things in your mouth, not a whole lot. Some medicines can be absorbed through the mucosal lining under your tongue, you know, like the nitroglycerin pills for cardiac patients you could put under there and certain other things, but not a whole lot. You also can absorb a little bit in the stomach, not a whole lot, small fatty acids, alcohol can be absorbed through the lining of the stomach, things like that. But the majority of all of the absorption of nutrients, almost all of it is absorbed in your small intestine. And then we still absorb water and electrolytes and some vitamins in the large intestine. So, it just depends on where we are and, you know, how the, the food molecules have been chemically processed and where they've been chemically processed. And then we're, we're able to absorb them into the blood. Whoops. Now, through the last part of the tube, which obviously includes your colon, as we get down to the colon on Thursday and finish the packet, you're going to see that one of the major roles in the colon is to extract as much water from the remaining food items that are in the intestine and the extraction of bicarbonate and some electrolytes and things like that and some vitamins that are actually made by the bacteria in our gut. And so when we extract that water from the food, we form this solid waste called feces and we expel it from the body when we go to the bathroom 
and that's called defecation. So these six processes have to be performed all, obviously all through your life in order for your digestive system to be working correctly and allow for you to extract the molecules from the food that you need to use by all the cells in the body to live. Now, by no means are we using this chapter to discuss nutrition. You have to take your nutrition class for that. I'm sure you, you all, all have to still take nutrition. Um, but I will preclude the, the rest of this conversation with this. <clears throat> Where There are six classes of nutrients. Three of those classes of nutrients are the only food molecules that you consume have calories in them. And so the calorie containing food items that you eat are sugars or carbohydrates, fats, and protein. Now, when I talk about enzymes that are breaking down your food molecules, the large food molecules that you consume are the polymers. Like starch is a huge polysaccharide. It's made of a bunch of glucose units bonded together. Well, that starch molecule is way too big to be absorbed in, through the lining of the intestine to go into your blood. So we have to have enzymes that will take that large complex polysaccharide and clip chemical bonds in the molecule that will then release smaller sugars and smaller sugars. And we process it chemically at a couple of different places so that by the time we have to absorb the individual sugars that we just clipped out of that large molecule in the small intestine, they're now individual sugars that can go across the lining. In the case of a protein, just to give you an idea, everybody remembers that proteins are made of amino acids, I'm sure. So proteins are these large polymers of bonded amino acids. And the bond between an amino acid is called a peptide bond, if you remember that, in which case we can call the proteins polypeptides. Well, those big polymers too are too big to be absorbed through the lining. So we have special enzymes that can break down proteins and amino acids. And so those bonds get clipped, releasing the amino acids so we can absorb them into the blood. So hopefully you guys are following that. Same thing with lipids, fats, triglycerides, we, the, which are large complex, have large complex hydrocarbons, fatty acid tails. <clears throat> we can't absorb all of that, it's too big. So we have to clip them down to smaller parts chemically. And that is all achieved by enzymes. And we're gonna learn some of the enzymes today. And, you know, until we get down to the stomach and I'll mention some of those. But my point here is this, those three classes of nutrients are typically large complex molecules you're acquiring in the food you eat. And we have to chemically break them down to smaller molecular forms. However, the other three classes of nutrients, you're not chemically breaking down. Water, vitamins, and minerals. You're not chemically breaking bonds in those. They also do not have calories to them. We, don't, we do not extract calories from water or your minerals, which include like the electrolytes you're familiar with, calcium, sodium, potassium, so forth and so on. Even iron we just talked about, iron in your diet, metal ion, right? So we're not extracting calorie energy from those nutrients no calories in water no calories in your minerals and of course we do we do not break vitamins down to extract energy from the bonds in a vitamin but what is ironic about that is some vitamins are required as cofactors in the biochemical pathways of aerobic respiration to extract the calorie energy from protein sugar and fat so your cells can make ATP. So we do need some vitamins for that, certain vitamins for that. And of course, we're not going back over glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and all of that. You did that in general biology. But 
So we, we don't have to chemically break down those things, just the sugar fats and the proteins into smaller molecular forms, if that makes sense. So let's talk about the salivary glands a little bit. There are three pair of salivary glands and no, we're not identifying them in here. That's for lab. Um, the largest of the pairs are the parotids. They lie just anterior to your ear, like on the side of your cheek, right in front of your ear. They're big. You have the submandibulars, <clears throat> which are lying just below your mandible. That's why it's called submandibular. More towards the back angle of the mandible. Um, and we have the sublinguals, which are below your tongue. So just below your tongue, we have the sublinguals. Now, the salivary glands are exocrine in nature. That means they produce their product, which obviously is saliva, and secrete that product to the site of action, which is in the oral cavity via a duct. So if you remember, all exocrine glands have ducts, but endocrine glands don't. So your salivary glands are exocrine in nature. They secrete the saliva to the oral cavity via their duct. Now we're gonna learn a little bit about what's in that saliva, right? Some of the enzymes in there, but just to let you know for now, and I'm gonna re-mention it, when you are eating food, obviously you're mixing your food with saliva. There's water in there, there's some ions, there's enzymes, some other things in there, lysozymes in there, uh, which is a bacteriolytic enzyme. But the point is, is that when you're chewing your food up, you're mixing it with saliva, which moistens your food. And it makes your food particles that you're eating more manageable to swallow, to go down your esophagus. And so we're going to talk about that here in a minute. <clears throat> so how do we break down our food items that we're consuming? Well, we could do it physically and we could do it chemically. So whenever a food item that you're consuming is physically broken down into smaller parts of the food, not, not breaking the chemical bonds, but making the food item you're eating smaller, basically chewing your food. <clears throat> so if you chew your food up, you're going to make little bitty pieces of the food, but you're not breaking your chemical bonds. It takes enzymes to do that. So in different parts of your system, like in your mouth from chewing your food, you're macerating your food into smaller parts. And even in your stomach, your stomach's going to churn your food up with, with gastric contractions of the smooth muscles called gastric motility. You can, we're going to liquefy our food, makes it even smaller particles. So whenever we're making the food molecule, I mean, the food item, physically smaller, we call that mechanical digestion, right? Chemical digestion is when we use enzymes to break the actual chemical bonds of large complex molecules so we can release smaller molecules from that nutrient. And so the example that I put here deals with the polysaccharides, which are the large complex sugars, carbohydrates made of many, 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 many individual sugar units. <clears throat> so in order to break down polysaccharides like starch, you guys know starch is a polysaccharide. You get a lot of starch and, you know, your potatoes, your French fries, your pastas and rice and different things, right? Well, starch is a polysaccharide of thousands and thousands of glucose units bonded together. Big, huge, large, complex polysaccharide. <clears throat> and so we can't absorb that. So salivary amylase is the enzyme in saliva that begins the chemical breakdown of starch and carbohydrates, polysaccharides in the mouth. You actually begin chemical digestion of carbohydrates in your mouth through the action of salivary amylase. Now, salivary amylase does not release individual sugar units yet. 
we're just beginning the process. But what it does do is it releases disaccharides, trisaccharides, or oligosaccharides, which means just, you know, a few sugars still bound together in one, in one group. A disaccharide is, are two sugar units bonded together. A trisaccharide are three, and any a little more than three, we call it oligo. It's just you have a few, but those in themselves are still too big to be absorbed. So we we don't complete the chemical digestion of sugar in the mouth, carbohydrates in the mouth. We just begin it there. So we take that big polysaccharide, we start to chemically to chop it into smaller pieces of carbohydrates, if that makes sense. So whenever you see amylase, and we have another one we have to deal with. Amylases are enzymes that break down carbohydrates into smaller chain carbohydrates. So long chain carbohydrates are broken down to smaller chain carbohydrates, basically by amylases. So the first amylase we're, you're learning is secreted by your salivary glands via the salivary gland duct into the oral cavity. Now you're chewing your food up, you're mixing it with saliva, it makes the food particles smaller and it makes them wet and moist. And by moistening the food, it allows you to taste it. I don't know if y'all know, but you can't taste anything that's dry. The molecules have to be dissolved in the water or partially dissolved in the water of saliva in your mouth for the receptors on your taste buds to, to sense them. So it allows us to taste our food, which is the sens sensation of gustation. We learned about in AMP1. <clears throat> so not only are we making our food more pliable and moistening it, and we can taste it, but we're mixing it with these enzymes. This is just one. We're going to learn another one in a second. And we then begin to chemically break and break and break a few of the bonds in that large polysaccharide, releasing smaller chain saccharides like disaccharides, trisaccharides, and some a little bit bigger than that. It makes them a little bit more manageable. Now on this chart, we're not learning everything on this chart. I want you to look at two places on here when you go to study at home. I want you to pay attention to the, the row that has the salivary glands in it and the row down here where you see lingual glands. So of course the salivary gland secretes saliva. It goes to the inside of your mouth, it moistens the inside of your mouth, it lubricates the inside of your mouth, it softens your food. Um, when you're not eating, it cleanses your teeth and your mouth because we constantly are washing saliva in the inside of our mouth and swallowing it, right? However, right here you see salivary amylase we just talked about starts to chemically split starches into smaller chain saccharides like disaccharides, maltose is a disaccharide. I don't know if you remember that one. So maltose, and we're gonna see another enzyme on Thursday in the small intestine that will actually break this disaccharide down into its individual subunits, uh, which if you remember is maltase. But maltose is a disaccharide, we have a trisaccharide, and then we have oligosaccharides, which are dextrins. These are just you know, shorter branch chain structures from that larger polysaccharide. So these are not complete, completely chemically broken down yet so we can absorb them, but we just made it a lot more manageable for the other enzymes in a lower part of your, your system that have to act on them. So we're not starting from scratch, right? So salivary amylase is, is, is a carbohydrate. That's a generic name for it, carbohydrates. The other enzyme that we need to know is this one, lingual lipase. It actually is mixed in saliva secreted in the salivary gland, but this enzyme comes from uh, gland cells at the base of our tongue, the lingual glands. And so whenever you see lipase, that's a generic word for any enzyme that can break down lipids, basically cleave lipids into smaller pieces like triglycerides primary lipids that we we consume not the only one but you know you you eat salad dressing oils and plant oils and all that kind of stuff it's not just triglycerides but nonetheless those those large lipid molecules are too big 
to be absorbed. Now we can absorb them a little bit differently in our intestine than the rest of the nutrients. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we get into the small intestine, but we still have to break them down some. So lipases break down triglycerides, in this case, in your mouth. They begin to break down triglycerides in the mouth into fatty acids and diglycerides. So if you remember, triglycerides are the lipids that have three fatty acid tails on them. That's why it's called tri. And then it's called a glyceride because the backbone of the molecule is a three carbon alcohol called glycerol. And that same, that same backbone glycerol is found in phospholipids as well. So in phospholipids, but they only have two tails, two fatty acid tails, triglycerides have three. We're gonna clip one off and you're left behind with what's called a diglyceride. Basically is that glycerol with two fatty acid tails on it. But what, how I'm gonna word it on a test is, you know, what enzyme begins to break down lipids in the mouth? And you would say lingual lipase or something. I don't know how I'm going to work. Something like that. All right. We're not getting in that deeply involved in the biochemistry of this. Trust me. So don't get too bogged down with that. I just like to explain the structure of the molecule a little bit so that you understand why we name them what we do. So lipases break down lipids. Carbohydrates break down carbohydrates. The enzymes that break down proteins generically are referred to as proteases, proteases. And we won't see our first protease until we get to the stomach. <clears throat> so in the mouth, then, if you're ever asked, we begin the chemical digestion of carbohydrates and some lipids, not a whole lot. We don't really rely on lingual lipase to do the majority of the brunt of the work for the chemical digestion of lipids, but we do begin it there, right? There's going to be some other enzymes that are going to help us with the lipids that we produce a lot of and a product from the liver that's going to aid in lipid digestion and then absorption later on. All right, so only the salivary gland row and this down here for lingual lipase right there. I'm not saying this other stuff's not important, but physiologically, I'm more interested in what the enzymes are doing. All right, so let's move down the tube and get to the esophagus. Again, we're not looking at a picture on the test, but you know your esophagus connects your mouth or the oral cavity to your stomach. It is a collapsible muscular tube. That means while you're not swallowing anything down your esophagus, it's pretty much closed off a little bit. It can collapse down on itself. <clears throat> and it's muscular. Just like the rest of the tube, there are layers to the wall of the GI tract. So even though I'm not putting the picture on the test, I always like to go down the layers here. This would be the inside of your esophagus, way up here at the top um, of the picture. A lumen is where the, the, the cavity in the middle of your esophagus is where we're swallowing our food through, right? So at the very top is where you see the mucous membrane. Now, mucous membranes are called that because they're made of, you know, special epithelial tissues that have the ability to produce, you know, some a mucousy secretion. Some areas produce a thicker mucus than other areas, but we call it a mucous membrane. It's different from a serous membrane that we covered. If you remember when we covered the heart, we talked about the pericardium, and I introduced the serous pericardium. We had the parietal and the visceral serous pericardium. When you say a serous membrane, that means that that membrane is secreting a serous fluid. It's involved in lubricating something somewhere. Well, this, our mucous membranes aren't necessarily creating a lubrication per se for moving parts, but it does keep everything moist and it does produce a protective layer down the length of the epithelium in our tubes. So in the esophagus and down the rest of the tube, the epithelium, 
that is the lining of the mucous membrane changes. The epithelium inside your mouth, your pharynx, which is your throat, and your esophagus looks like this, top of this picture. That, let me enlarge it a little bit. So if you look right here, from here up, that is a non keratinized stratified squamous that you learned about in AMP1. This tissue is found lining the mouth, the esophagus, and even the vaginal canal. All of the cells in this stratified squamous are living. So the epidermis that surrounds the outside of your body is a stratified squamous as well, except all of the cells at the very top layer are dead. In which case we would call that tissue that forms the epidermis a keratinized stratified squamous. So my point is this, we don't have this stratified squamous all the way down the length of the tube. The epithelium changes. It changes to a simple columnar to cuboidal epithelium as we approach it, get into the stomach and the intestine and all of that. It's actually a simple epithelial tissue layer, not a stratified one. And we have a bunch of columnar cells in there. And in certain places, we have these scattered cuboidal cells as well. So below the epithelium forming the top layer of the mucous membrane, we have what's called a lamina propria. Now, the connective tissue that forms that is an areolar connective tissue. I'm not putting that on the test, by the way. That was for AMP1. I'm just telling you what's there. Is that areolar connective tissue just below that? We have a little layer of muscle tissue, which is still in what's called the mucosal lining. And so that's called the muscularis mucosa, that smooth muscle in there. Below that is what we consider the area below the mucosal lining. So we call it the submucosa. Some collagen fibers in there supporting blood vessels and all of that stuff and nerves and, and a nerve plexus all in there, uh, certain types of glands that with tubes and whatnot can be in there in certain parts of the tube. Below that, we have two layers of muscle tissue, smooth muscle again, that's ca all called the muscularis. There's a layer that encircles the entire tube <clears throat> and it goes around the tube this way. That's called the circular muscle layer. We then have a layer, that's the outer layer of muscle tissue that runs the entire length of the tube long ways. That's called the longitudinal layer. Now on the outside of that, which is the very outside of the tube. So if I was touching the tube from the outside, I would be touching the outside portion, which is called the adventitia. Um, if you do have lab on that model, the mucosal model in lab, which is basically a section out of the small intestine, um, the very bottom part of that model is yellow, that little layer, it's called the serosa. So that's just another name we can give for adventitia. It's called the serosa. Now, what is not shown here is that the very outer part, especially on your stomach and your intestine, you know, the organs in your, uh, the tube in your abdominal cavity, it's all lined by a simple squamous epithelium, <clears throat> which produces a serose fluid. So we have a mucous membrane lining the inside of the tubes, but on the outside, we have a serous membrane because, and, and which is called the peritoneal membrane. And we have a parietal and a visceral one as well, right? So just to let you know, the, the very surface of the intestine, let's say in this picture, if you were to touch it, you would be touching a simple squamous epithelial tissue, which forms the visceral peritoneum. The parietal layer is the innermost lining of the abdominal wall. So if we dissect it open an organism and we touch the inside of the abdominal wall, you would be touching a simple squamous epithelial layer, which would be called the parietal peritoneum. And so that's why often we can also, instead of calling just this the abdominal cavity, we can say the peritoneal cavity. Because in between the visceral and parietal peritoneal membranes, the serous membranes, there's a little slippery fluid being produced. It's called peritoneal fluid. 
because let's face it, we have a lot of smooth muscle contraction going on in the intestine, a lot in the stomach and the intestine, large, all these organs are sliding past one another. So we have to have them lubricated. So that's where that peritoneal fluid comes from. All right. So that's on the outside, very outside of the tube everywhere. Now, your esophagus obviously is going to attach your mouth to your stomach, really the, the oral cavity and the back of your mouth at the what's called the pharynx to your stomach. And that's where we're going to swallow our food through. And swallowing your food is referred to as deglutition. There's three main stages of deglutition. Only one of those three stages is voluntary. And so you can consciously decide at that point if you want to swallow whatever's in your mouth or not. You can either spit it out or you can choose to swallow it. But after that food item, which I'm going to talk about, makes its way to the very back of your pharynx at what's called the oropharynx. We're gonna learn that when we do chapter 23. There's three parts to your pharynx back here, which is your, your throat. So when that food item gets pushed to the back of your throat, the oral pharynx, by the action of your tongue, you go to the involuntary stages of, of swallowing. So let me show you how this works. First of all, you ingest food, you chew it up, you're mixing it with saliva, the saliva moistens the food. You're physically breaking the food item down into smaller parts through mechanical digestion. And you're mixing your food up with the enzymes and other substances in saliva. So the enzymes can begin to act on their polymer to start chemically breaking them down. Remember, we, we began the breakdown of carbohydrates with salivary amylase. And we began a little bit of lipid digestion, chemical digestion with lingual lipase. Now, this food item that we just chewed up and mixed it with saliva, and now it's moist, and we turn it into this little partially moistened ball of food, is called a bolus. So when you're ready to swallow your food, you literally manipulate that bolus to the back of your pharynx, the oral pharynx. And when that happens, the uvula, which is a little doolally thing that hangs in the back of your throat. When you look in the mirror and you see that little doolally back there, it's kind of funny when you say doolally thing, huh? Back there. Uh, the, the uvula gets pushed upward so that it blocks off the nasopharynx. So we don't want food to go up the opening of the nasal pharynx because that leads to the back of the nasal cavity. This is all the nasal cavity up here in your nose. You guys see that on, on the picture. So when we go to swallow, your uvula is preventing your food and water, drink, whatever you're doing from going back up through the nasal cavity. At the same time, you then are forcing the food down the oral pharynx into what's called the laryngopharynx. And at that point, your one of the cartilages that forms your voice box right here's your voice box it's called the larynx one of the cartilages there called the epiglottis actually folds over the opening of your trachea your windpipe you see your esophagus lies posterior to your trachea so we have a little piece of cartilage that has a little hinge on it that actually folds over the opening and that's called the glottis, the opening of your trachea. It folds over that opening so your food and drink, what you're swallowing, slides past the opening of your trachea. Now, this stage is called the pharyngeal stage, and it's involuntary. Once your food is manipulated to the back of the oral pharynx, and we closed off that epiglottis, that food's going to your stomach, whatever you just swallowed. You're not making it go backwards at that point. So we have voluntary muscle action. Your tongue is voluntary, a skeletal muscle. The superior portions, especially in the pharynx, we have some skeletal muscle. But at the, the, 
the top superior edges of the esophagus, we begin to have smooth muscle. <clears throat> Does chewing food slowly increase the efficiency of secretion of lipase? Um, I'm sure it does. I don't know. I don't know how much more effective that is, but the time value, if you think about the time value involved in causing the food to be mixed with the enzymes, I think is the more important question. So even if we had a steady state secretion of say lipase and the other enzymes from, from the salivary gland, I think the more important question would be how long are we leaving the food items in our mouth to be mixed with the enzymes that are working in our mouth? So if you just stick a piece of food in your mouth and you just swallow it real quick, the efficiency with which the enzymes that operate in your mouth probably didn't do much. They probably didn't begin to digest their carbohydrates very well or the lipids, right? So I think that's the more important question which we haven't gotten into this concept yet, but the pH, since we brought it up now, the pH in the different parts, in the fluids in the different parts of our digestive system are important. So the pH in your mouth is more alkaline, more basic than the pH in your stomach. Everybody already knows you have acid in your stomach. So, so your stomach is acidic relative to your saliva in your mouth. Your stomach is a lot more acidic than the secretions that go to your small intestine. They're more basic. So here's the kicker. The enzymes that we produce that are responsible for chemical digestion have an optimal pH range that they can only operate within. So when the enzymes from your mouth and saliva reach your stomach, they don't work anymore because they don't work in that acid environment. So their mode of action only works while we're, we're mixing the food up in our mouth in a very, very short amount of time that is going down your esophagus, which doesn't take very much time at all, by the way. So we always consider it the amount of time that's in our mouth. When kids swallow toys and stuff, how come it doesn't go through the esophagus? Sometimes it can. It can tear a hole in the esophagus, right? Um, it, oh, and if something's going in the trachea, blocking the trachea, is that what you're talking about? It must be going through the trachea and blocking the trachea. Well, that's something a little different. I mean, I'm not saying that when something goes down your trachea, that's called aspiration, when you aspirate something. So when someone swallows anything that is a foreign object, there is a potential chance that you can rupture the tissues of the esophagus. The esophageal lining is a mucous membrane. However, one good thing about it is, and one reason why we have this, is that one of the roles of a stratified squamous epithelium is protection. So we can have something go down our esophagus and rip away several layers of these tissue cells, but we still have some there that's giving us some, some amount of protection. Now, it's not 100% efficient. Aside other problems is acid reflux, a function of poorly chewed food. It could be. It also could be um, foods that you eat that have some sort of an irritant in it. Um, you know, more acidic foods can irritate the muscle action of something I'm about to talk about, the lower esophageal sphincter. So acid reflux um, or uh, GERD, that's a disease form of it. That's a constant um gastroesophageal reflux disease that's when it happens you know a few times a week or something i forget the exact distinction it's either two times a week or three times a week i forget the exact definition of when they would diagnose it as GERD but nonetheless if a person with GERD they're having a lot more acid reflux than someone else so they don't just call it simple acid reflux but the reflux of the acid, oh, you're welcome. The reflux of the acid, no matter what the cause is, medication someone is taking, uh, the types of foods they're eating, uh, even certain types of illnesses, all right, that cause you to be nauseous and you begin to vomit. All that acid irritates the lining of the esophagus and causes esophageal erosion. If you're constantly causing acid reflux or if someone is constantly vomiting, 
like in some of those eating disorders, you know, uh, with people that have body dysmorphia and they think they're, they're, you know, fat and they really aren't and they can't eat and they go vomit. I think that's called bulimia when they do that. Right. Um, so those individuals always have erosion in their esophagus. They have erosion in their teeth from the acid constantly. So that's bad. You're, you're damaging the lining of, of the esophagus when that happens, which can cause little tears in the esophagus. Um, severe alcoholics, in, in particular, people that drink massive amounts of uh, pure alcohol, like, like not you know, necessarily like a beer drink or something like that, but like drinking pure vodka or liquor and stuff like that constantly. They have erosion down the length of their lower parts of their esophagus that can cause esophageal bleeds and cause a massive internal bleeding. And you could die from that. Um, and that's one route by which many massive alcoholics do die. I'm not saying all of them, but it, it damages the lining of the esophagus, right? All right, so let's get through this real quick so I can introduce um, that other stuff before I leave. I was supposed to leave at 1.30. Looks like I'm going to be a little late. Um, so let's look at uh, deglutition, the last stage. The pharyngeal stage is involuntary. So once it gets here, it's going down, and then we, we lead to the esophageal phase or stage. So during that stage, we have smooth muscle, automatic, Smooth muscle contraction, remember it's involuntary. Uh, don't worry about circular and longitudinal, just know we have this wave-like contraction down the length of the tube. It's actually called peristalsis that propels the bolus to where the esophagus joins to the stomach. Now, dealing with acid reflux that Aram just brought up, this is where this happens. The lower esophageal sphincter is a circular band of smooth muscle that encircles the entry point of the esophagus to the stomach at what's called the cardiac region of the stomach, or it's just called the cardia, just around where the esophagus joins. And so when we're not swallowing food, that circular band of muscle stays contracted and closes off the, this end of the opening of the esophagus. So there are certain types of irrit irritants, medications, um, illnesses, uh, viral infections that can cause this muscle to actually open and close, open and close when there is an irritation there. And that will cause a little bit of reflux of acid from the stomach up into the lower part of the esophagus. And sometimes it comes up to the back of our mouth and we kind of can taste it. And if you know it, that bitter taste, if you ever had that happen, kind of burns back there. That's the hydrochloric acid coming up, right? So once the bolus enters the stomach, well, when it's entering the stomach, the lower esophageal sphincter has to relax. And when it relaxes, it opens and the bolus goes into the stomach. And once it's in the stomach, the sphincter contracts again and closes off this opening. So nothing regurgitates back up into the esophagus. All right. Now, the part I wanted to end on is the next slide that deals with the gastric glands, but let me tell you a little bit about what goes on with the stomach. So our food has been mixed with saliva. We've physically broken it down through maceration, chewing, mechanical digestion. All of that now is being swallowed as a bolus. It goes to the stomach and it's gonna join with gastric juice. Gastric juice, it is anything that is secreted to the inside of the stomach. I'm going to show you some of that just right here and then show you the cells that do it. So we just call it gastric juice. There's acid, hydrochloric acid in there, some enzymes, whatever. So once that happens, your bolus, which is a partially dissolved food item that's been balled up, mixed with saliva, is liquefied. So your food becomes a liquid in your stomach. And that liquefied form of the food that you're consuming is called chyme right here, chyme. So from this point forward, down the length of the GI tract, your food is a liquid, which we call chyme. But often when I describe it, I just always still say food, you know, but it is a liquidified form, it's called chyme. Now your stomach obviously can hold your food until it is 
emptied into the small intestine. So it acts as a temporary reservoir for your food, more so as we are involved in mixing the food up with the gastric juice and the enzymes in there that we have to contend with. Because we are going to begin the chemical digestion of protein in the stomach. So what's in gastric juice? Well, you know there's acid in there. The acid is hydrochloric acid. That's a hydrogen and a chloride ion, right? Um, this is an inorganic acid. It's produced by the parietal cells that I'm about to tell you about. We also have a protein digesting enzyme, which is called a protease. The enzyme is pepsin. This is in your stomach. This is the activated form of it. And it begins to break down protein in your stomach into smaller pep peptide chains. We also have intrinsic factor um, secreted in gastric juice from our gastric gland. This is a, responsible for the absorption of vitamin B12. We need this to absorb those B vitamins. And then we have an enzyme called gastric lipase. Just like we had a lingual lipase, we now have gastric lipase. So these enzyme, two enzymes, pepsin and gastric lipase are active in the stomach because they can work in a low pH environment. The enzymes in saliva are inactivated in that low pH environment. So here are, oh, I forgot to tell you about gastrin. From the gastric gland, we also have a G cell that produces a hormone called gastrin. And this gastrin is gonna get into the blood but then circulate to the exterior or ex, extracellular membrane of, a, of the parietal cell and some other cells in there that cause an increase in gastric secretion and gastric motility, which we're gonna be getting into. So basically gastrin increases gastric function, the gastric phase of digestion. So this is a very simplified picture of the lining of the stomach. We have that simple columnar epithelium with some scattered cuboidal cells here and there. And so up here is a lumen of the stomach where your food would be, the chyme, well, where we're liquefied into chyme. But the, the lumen, the wall, if you will, has this little gastric pit in it that leads down to the gastric glands. The gastric glands include mucus cells, which are located either more towards the surface or down into where the, the pit is located to the gland. Those are called the neck mucus cells. So we have surface and neck cells. They secrete mucus. That mucus is important because it's a fairly thick mucoid secretion that forms a protective barrier on the surface of the epithelium that lines your stomach. Because these parietal cells are dumping out hydrochloric acid that goes up to the lumen of the stomach and if we didn't have that protective mucus layer there, we would constantly eat a hole through the stomach lining. You would constantly have a peptic ulcer. So that's what a hole in your stomach is, a peptic ulcer. So different things can cause the peptic ulcers, but typically it's the thinning of your muc mucus layer. Whatever the, the causative agent is, uh, H. pylori, helicobacter pylori, bacterial infection can cause that. Various types of overconsumed medications can cause that um, and the like. So we have the mucus cell protects us. The parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid and intrinsic factor. So these are similar types of questions I could ask. What cell produces what? Make sure you review it. The chief cell produces the enzymes for us. So chief cells produce the enzyme pepsin in an inactivated form, which is called pepsinogen and we activate it once it hits the lumen of the stomach. Hydrochloric acid actually activates it for us. So this pepsinogen is secreted in an inactive form because it was secreted in an active form, it would digest all the proteins in a cell that was making it, which would be bad. And they also secrete that gastric lipase. That's gonna work on some lipids for us in the stomach. And then we have the G cells. Those produce a hormone called gastrin, which helps increase the activity of the stomach motility and secretion mechanisms during the gastric phase of digestion. All right. All right. So next time I'm going to pick up with this to show you how we can increase the, the amount of hydrochloric acid and how it's actually produced by the parietal cell and the signal mediators 
that are going to increase the action of the parietal cell force when we need to make more acid. So I'll tell you when and why that happens on Thursday. All right, we're going to stop here today. We're going to finish up chapter 24 on Thursday. I want to say chow real quick before Aram does. And so uh, Thursday, click on the link that's going to be in the announcement under the announcement that will say permanent class meeting link or something like that. And you'll always just go to that announcement and click on that link. So we all are going to the same place from now on. All right. Um, so does anybody have any questions for me? Ha uh -huh, Aram, I said chow. Oh, by the way, Aram, just to let you know my class earlier, I got into my announcement like I just did and I forgot to say chow and everybody was laughing at me because I didn't beat them. <laughs> all right um yeah it was funny they, they laugh at me now in there all right well just email me if you need me and i'll see you guys on thursday ciao again bye, guys <laughs>